Congregation, this afternoon we pay attention to what God has revealed about his Son, our Lord. Scriptural teaching about that as the church has summarized that and we confess it in Lord's Day 13 of the Heidelberg Catechism. And in that connection we read, first of all this afternoon, from John chapter 1, the verses 1 through 18, and then we turn to Galatians chapter 3, read from verse 26 through to chapter 4, verse 7. So John chapter 1, the verses 1 through 18. Hear the word of our God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So far from John 1, we turn now to the letter to the Galatians and we begin reading at verse 26 of chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son then an heir of God through Christ. So far the reading of God's holy word. Congregation, as we prepare to listen to God's word proclaimed, let us sing from Psalm 43, stanza 3. Psalm 43, stanza 3.
this afternoon we pay attention to what God's word has revealed about those two names, God's only begotten Son and our Lord, as the church has summarised that, and we confess in Lord's Day 13 of the Heidelberg Catechism. Let us read that Lord's Day together, as we have that on page 528 of our books of praise. And there it is asked and answered, why is he called God's only begotten son since we also are children of God? Because Christ alone is the eternal, natural son of God. We, however, are children of God by adoption through grace for Christ's sake. Why do you call him our Lord? Because he has ransomed us body and soul from all our sins, not with silver or gold, but with his precious blood and has freed us from all the power of the devil to make us his own possession. After listening to the preaching of God's word, let us sing in response from hymn 25, stanza 1. Hymn 25, stanza 1, after the sermon. Beloved congregation of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, there is a knock on your front door. Upon answering it, you discover that it's the Jehovah Witnesses that want to pay you a visit. They've come to have a discussion with you about the terrible state our society is in or some other catchy topic. And you're probably aware that these people do not believe that Jesus Christ is true God. They don't believe that he is the eternal, natural Son of God, as we confess in this Lord's Day. But really, how serious is their denial of the divinity of Christ? How serious is it that they refuse to believe that he is true God? They still believe that he's someone very important. And they still believe in God and they want to make society a better place. How serious is their error? Now, Lord's Day this afternoon describes how Christ's sonship is different from the way in which we are children of God. And congregation, is this just a matter of splitting hairs? Christ is the eternal, natural Son, while we are children by adoption? Or is something more fundamental at stake? Is the divinity of Jesus Christ important? The answer is a resounding yes. A yes that the church has maintained from its earliest days. The Jehovah's Witnesses, as well as meaning as they might appear, are messengers of Satan, for they deny the heart of the gospel. And so our theme this afternoon will be, the eternal natural Son of God restores us as children of God. We'll see two things. First of all, Christ alone is the eternal natural Son of God, and we are children of God by adoption through grace For Christ's sake. So the eternal natural Son of God restores us as children of God. And we see, first of all, Christ alone is the eternal natural Son of God. And secondly, we are children of God by adoption through grace for Christ's sake. First of all, we pay attention to the fact that Christ alone is the eternal natural Son of God. There are different ways in which the name Son of God is used in the Bible. God speaks about his people in Hosea in that way. When the Lord says, Out of Egypt I called my son. That's a reference to his people. Israel was God's son. And Son of God was also a name that God used in connection with the king of Israel. In 2 Samuel 7, God said about Solomon, I will be his father and he shall be my son. It's a name that is also applied to believers. We read that in John 1. 
As many as believed in Jesus Christ to them was given the right to become children of God. And in Galatians 4, Jesus redeemed us so that we might receive the adoption as sons. But why then is it considered so special that Jesus Christ is called the Son of God? Given that Israel and the Old Testament kings and the New Testament believers are all called sons of God, why is Christ's sonship distinguished as something special? As the Catechism asks, why is he called God's only begotten son since we also are children, are sons and daughters of God? And the answer is, Jesus Christ is God's son in a unique way. He's the only begotten son of God. Totally different from any other sons of God. He's the eternal, the natural son of God. That means he is the son of God by nature. Just as your children share your nature, they have a human nature like you have a human nature, so the son of God has the same nature as his father. He has a divine nature, meaning he is God, just as the father has a divine nature. But that doesn't mean that he was born from the Father at a particular point in time. He's the eternal Son of God. The Father has never, ever been without his Son. In the Athanasian Creed, we confess he was begotten before time. He's eternally God's Son. And that's because he is of one substance with the Father, as we have it in the Nicene Creed. The Father is God and the Son is God too. On this Lord's Day we confess that Jesus Christ is God. He's the eternal, natural Son of God. That means He is God as much as the Father is God. And that becomes clear from what we read in John 1. In that chapter, the Lord Jesus is referred to as the Word of God. And John writes the following about the Word. He says in verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. In other words, before all things, the Word, whom he later on tells us is Jesus Christ, before all things, the Word was there. And then he says, and the Word was with God. That means the Word stood in a very close relationship with God. But then more must be said, because John continues, and the Word was God. The Word was not just with God, he was himself God. And that teaches us a couple of things. On the one hand, the fact that John says that the Word was with God shows that there is a distinction between the Word and the Father. There is a distinction in God. The Father is distinct from the Son. But on the other hand, we are also taught that the Word is God. There is a unity of essence, as it were. The Word is God, the Father is God, and together they are not two gods, but one God. Now you're probably thinking, that goes beyond what I can comprehend. And, and congregation, we stand here before deep mysteries. Mysteries which heretics have attacked from the earliest times, have mocked, and the Jehovah Witnesses and others continue to attack today. It's something we cannot fully comprehend. That the Word is God, distinct from the Father, who is also God and yet not two gods, but only one God. And that's the reason why it is attacked. People cannot get their minds around this. But just because we cannot get our minds around it, that's never a reason to reject it. Why do we confess it? It's because God has revealed it, not because we figured it out in our heads. He's the Son of God in a unique way. He's the eternal, natural Son of God. He is God as the Father is God. And that's something that our Lord 
Jesus brought out in his work on earth. He spoke very openly about the fact that God was his father, but in such a way that the people was clear to them that he was claiming to be son of God in a greater way than that in which Israel was God's son or the Old Testament king was God's son. For example, in John chapter 5, Jesus Christ enraged the Jews when he justified his healing on the Sabbath with these words, My father has been working until now and I have been working. We read in response, the Jews sought to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. The Jews understood Jesus was claiming that God was his father in a unique way. And they didn't, Jesus didn't argue with that. In fact, he went on to make even clearer to the Jews his special relationship with the Father, for he was doing the Father's work, divine work. Clearly from his words and works, Jesus Christ was Son of God in a unique way. The Son who was equal to God, who was true God. And that raises the question, so what's the significance of this? Why is it important that we confess this? Well, John 1 Verse 14 says that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that's an incredibly amazing thing to which more attention is given in the following Lord's Day, Lord's Day 14. The Word who was with God, who was God, the eternal, natural Son of God, He became flesh and blood. He came down to earth He lived and breathed and walked and talked on this earth. Became a man, one of us. That man, Jesus Christ, he was God. That's astounding, beloved, and it's something we need to, to think through. You think of John the Baptist standing at the Jordan River, baptizing the people that came to him. And then they all came, one after another. All these these human beings came to him to be baptised. Among all those people that came, there was also one who was at the same time true God. A man of Israel, a Jew. Jesus of Nazareth stood there at the Jordan. But that man was also the word of God, the eternal, natural son of God. That man was God himself who had come to earth, who had taken on human flesh and blood, who had taken up residence in this world. Sin had created a divide, a barrier between God and man. Nothing man could ever do would ever bring him back to God. The way back into paradise was closely guarded in more than one sense. Man could never, ever of himself come to God. In fact, so sinful is man, he would never of himself even want to be reconciled and restored with God. But God has come to man. That's the amazing thing. God has crossed that barrier and he has done that to reveal himself to man. As we read in John 1, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. God dwells in inaccessible light and cannot be seen by men. Even Moses, who asked to see God, was only allowed to see God's back. And God is not like a creature in this creation. Most creatures... And things they can be studied and investigated. You can come to understand what they are made up of and what makes them tick and so on. But not so God. As we read in Job 11, can you search out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limits of the Almighty? There can be no knowledge of God from the outside. We, we cannot figure out God as we might figure out how a volcano works. 
The barrier between God and man can never be crossed from the side of man. And yes, it's true, all men have, have an idea of God and so most cultures will worship something. But they end up worshipping creatures and, and things that their imagination has made up. They will never come to the true knowledge of God from themselves. But then Jesus Christ was born, who is true God. Man cannot go to God, but God comes to man. And because Jesus is God, he was able to reveal who God is. In Jesus Christ, we come to know and see God as he is. And that, beloved, is a very rich truth, a truth very hard to capture completely in words. God has come down to man in the person of his son so that we might come to know God. The only begotten of the Father. He has declared the Father to us. He has revealed God to us. <clears throat> and that's true in a number of different ways. The fact that God is triune that there are three distinct persons in God. Nobody could work that out themselves, for it's a mystery that we cannot fully comprehend. That there are three persons who are God, and yet only one God. You know, we can't get our minds around that. And yet, through Jesus Christ, that's exactly how we have come to know God, as the triune God. You see in that way how the Lord Jesus Christ has revealed God to us. He has revealed who God really is. He has revealed the Father. He reveals those, those inner relationships in the Trinity. There is a Father and there is a Son. The Father loves the Son and the Son loves the Father. The Father and the Son work together. And then also... Expanding on this, there is a spirit. The spirit, as the Lord Jesus revealed, of the Father and the Son. And the spirit too is God, the triune God. Through the eternal, natural Son of God, through Jesus Christ, in his teaching and preaching, we come to know God as he is in himself. The Son has revealed more about God. He didn't just come to earth to tell us a number of interesting facts about who God is and then leave again. <coughs> Rather, he, the Son of God, God himself, came to earth to reveal himself to us and his plan for our salvation. You could say, he has revealed who God is in a way that no one else could reveal God. And he shows that in the innermost workings of God, God is working as triune God for our salvation, us sinners. He revealed to us, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to die for sinners. In the Son of God, we see the mercy, the grace of God. And note, beloved, the Son is not like a prophet who is a creature and nothing more. Such a prophet could only speak about what the Spirit had revealed to him. But the Son is God himself. He reveals God as he is in himself. When the Son works, then the Father is working through him. As we learn that the Son has come to earth to save sinners and everything that went with that, then we see in that the love of God for us sinners. The Son is not separate from the Father, but the Father manifests himself, he, he reveals himself through his Son. Because the Son and the Father together are the true and eternal God. That means that when the Son acts, then we see the love of the Father for us. It's not as if there is a, a dark, hidden, unknown God the Father hiding behind Jesus Christ that we can never really come to know. Maybe that would be possible if Jesus Christ was only a representative of God, speaking to man on behalf of God. 
And whatever Jesus said about God, that would simply be his representation of what God is like. And we could never be sure, is God really as Jesus said he was? For then Jesus would be a creature with the same limitations as us, unable to give true knowledge of God to man. But Jesus is far more than just a representative of God. He is God. It's God himself who came to man in the person of Christ. And so we have come to know God as being full of grace and mercy for us sinners. That's not a creaturely impression of God, but that's how God has revealed himself to us by coming to us in his Son. In the Son of God, you could say, the heart and mind of God are laid open to us. We are shown the inner workings of the Trinity as God comes to man with his salvation. There in the Son, we see the great love of God for sinners. The Son came to earth to heal sickness, to forgive sins, to redeem lost humanity. And the Son tells us He's not someone separate from God, but He's one with the Father in His working. What Jesus did while He was on earth, that is God working for the salvation of sinners. In Jesus Christ, we behold the glory of God. And that congregation is the rich significance of Jesus Christ being the eternal, natural Son of God. When you read through the Gospels, then you learn about and come to know Jesus Christ, the Son born to Mary. And those who have come to know the mercy, the work, the life restoration work of that man, Jesus Christ, the man that walked and talked in Palestine so long ago, they have come to see and know God as he is in himself. And God has come to us. The Son of God has become man so that he might restore us as children of God. As we come to see in the second point, we are children of God by adoption through grace for Christ's sake. Yes, we too are children of God. That's what we have been made because of the only begotten Son of God. Children, we were in the beginning. Adam is called the Son of God. God created man not just to be another creature, but to be his child. But that privilege we as mankind threw away through the fall into sin. We became rebels, enemies of God. And it's through the eternal, natural Son of God and through Him alone that we are restored as children of God. We read in Galatians that God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And do you realize, brothers and sisters, that he could only do that, that he could only restore us as children because he is the eternal, natural Son of God. For we needed to be redeemed, our debt needed to be paid. And what was the price for our redemption? It was very high, it was more than silver or gold. It would take nothing less than bearing the burden of God's heavy, terrible wrath against sin. Nobody who was only man, only a creature, would ever be able to make such an incredibly great payment. There is no way for man from his side to be able to earn his way back into being a son of God, enjoying that restored relationship. And that's why it's so comforting that Jesus Christ is the son of God, true God. God took on human nature so that our sins might indeed be paid for in human flesh. He laid down his life. He shed his blood to pay for our sins. That's the wonder of the incarnation, that the Son of God became man, so he might, by shedding his blood, purchase us back and restore us as God's children. 
He bought us by shedding his blood for us. That precious blood. You've become his possession. He purchased you. That's what you confess in the name Lord. That fills us with comfort. He has made us his possession so that we might be restored as sons. He gives us the spirit by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. That means the spirit works in us. He makes us believe that God is our father. He works in us that we speak to God and address God as father. You know, so many people look for identity today and try and make something of their life, give it some purpose. But you, beloved, you already have that. Jesus is your Lord. You are his possession. And that's what fills your life with purpose. As the Son, he is heir of all things. That means all things are given to him for his possession because he's the Son of God. But then he makes us his brothers, his brothers and sisters, fellow heirs with him. He has revealed to us the Father. He has brought us back to the Father and so we are children of God. And we now live with the promise of an incredible inheritance. We are going to inherit the new heavens and earth as our possession. That's the glorious future for the children of God. We have the certainty of eternal life because Jesus has restored us as God's children. Can we be sure that we will go to heaven, that we will enjoy eternal life? Yes, as certainly as we believe that Jesus Christ is God's only begotten Son and our Lord. Therein lies the certainty of your salvation. It's only because he is the eternal natural Son of God that he could do all these things. He needed to be God to ransom us from our sins. He needed to be God to pour out His Spirit, the Spirit of adoption on us. He needed to be God to reveal the Father to us. He needed to be God to bring us back to God. That's the wonder in His name. Son of God. God has come to us rebels in His Son to bring us back to Himself we would never have been able to come to God from our side. But God has come to our side from His to bring us back to Himself. See here then, beloved, the terrible poverty of all who would deny that Jesus Christ is the eternal, natural Son of God. For if that's so, then God has not come to us then God remains in heaven and we on earth and there is no bridge in between. It's striking that the Jehovah's Witnesses deny that Jesus Christ is the eternal natural Son of God and they also believe that they more or less have to save themselves by their own efforts. They are attempting to find their way back to God. They have denied the way that God has given the way by which God comes to us himself in Jesus Christ to restore us as children of God. And so faith in Jesus Christ as God's only begotten Son is no insignificant issue. It's the heart of the gospel that is at stake. Our salvation stands or falls with whether or not we believe that Jesus Christ is God's eternal natural Son of one substance with the Father. And our Lord's work for us is comprehensive. We confess in the second answer of this Lord's Day that he ransoms us, body and soul, from all our sins to make us his own possession. He ransoms us, body and soul, not just our souls, but our souls and bodies as children of God. And that's comforting too. It encourages us in the midst of the ups and downs of this life. I am now a child of God. Through faith in Christ, my soul is secure for Christ has redeemed it, but also my body is safe. 
Yes, I don't know what is in store for my body in this life. But I know that as many days as have been allotted to me, for so many will God grant me his protection and nurture. And even when this body perishes, I know that he will give me a glorified body on the last day. After all, I've become his son. He gave me Christ, his only begotten son, so that I might be restored as his son in body and soul forever. And the comprehensive nature of his redeeming work also confronts us with our calling. We must see ourselves as totally the possession of Jesus Christ. God has come to us, has restored us so that we might now live for him, so that we might glorify him, that we give our lives in his service. That's why he has come to us in his Son, to restore us as his sons and daughters who in all things seek the glory and honor of their heavenly Father. Let that be the reason, congregation, to show thankfulness for the amazing work that God has done for you. He has come to redeem you, body and soul, from all your sins. Therefore, give your lives in everything, in every part of your life, in thankful service to him. Live as his children because that's what he's restored you to day after day. Let us show in our speech, in the way we dress, in the way we treat one another, in our actions. Let it be clear what God's Son has done for us, that we've been restored as children of God. We are no longer rebels. But we are those who've been brought back to God by God himself. The name of our Saviour is God's only begotten Son, our Lord. See in the name Son, God has come to us in Jesus Christ, brought us back to himself, something we could never have done. His name is also our Lord. He's paid the price for our redemption. He's purchased us so that we are now his possession. In these names, we confess the certainty of our salvation, the certainty of our being restored as children of God to the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be the glory forever. Amen.